So let's get the lecture up. Um, so hello. I am, I've been teaching IT140 for a while. I do these lectures every Thursday night um, at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time so that people on the West Coast aren't like missing it because they work. Um, and so I guess let's just get started. So what we are doing this week is we are starting to, to build foundations to learn to program in Python. And those foundations are variables, types, and strings. Um, and just some general information about what programming is. So we're going to write some small Java pro sorry, I programmed in Java today, some small Python programs. And uh, we're going to go over all the labs. We'll do that at the end of the class. Um, so yeah, what are we going to learn here in Module 1? First, we're going to learn about variables. Variables are a container for data. What is data? Just about anything. It can be a string. It can be a picture. It can be a movie. It can be an instruction for a joystick. A variable can be just about anything, but it, sorry, data can be just about anything. A variable is a place to put that inside the program so that you can recall it later. A statement is just an instruction to the Python interpreter to do something. And you will find out that there are lots of some things that can be done. A string literal is any text in quotes. And Python assumes everything is a string unless in some way you tell it it's not. The Python interpreter is the engine that takes all the code you write and translates it into computer language so that the computer can do something with it. The computer is, and you'll hear me say this a lot more in Module 3, computers are stupid. Computers only know two states. They only know on and off. It's like a light switch. Not a dimmer switch, but just an on-off light switch. And so something has to take the words that we're typing and make those happen on the computer. And that, for Python, is the Python interpreter. We're going to learn a couple of new functions this week. We're going to learn about the input function and the print function. Input, convert, takes anything from the keyboard, or let me type it on the keyboard, and it makes it a string and puts it into Python. And output does the opposite. It takes information from Python and it writes it to the console, it writes it to your computer screen. Because all of our interaction in this class with Python is going to be via the keyboard. Um, it's called a text-based interface. And um, a lot of people aren't really familiar with that because so much, you know, because we've got mice and we've got joysticks and we've got game consoles. But for this class, we're sticking with keyboard input. What are some new operators? Well, symbols, really. Sorry, the second one isn't an operator. It's a symbol. Equal is a single equal sign. Is an assignment. It is saying, take what's on the right-hand side of the equal sign and basically assign it to what's on the left-hand side of single equal sign. This will be used with variables. Your single equal sign will always be used with a variable. And the variable is the thing on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And that pound is just um, at the beginning of a line is a way to write a comment. Now, a comment is simply a line of text in a file that doesn't get executed. It has no effect on the interpreter no effect on the running program. What it does have an effect on is when your teacher is grading and you want to explain something to them, 
and there's also some some points associated with this sometimes you want to put a comment in so that they know you know what you're doing arithmetic operators we have plus minus multiplication division and um, exponentiation there's also um, the floor operator which we'll talk about a little later next week next week week three in week three but these are pretty much standard operators and they work pretty much as you would expect in in math okay programs have a flow the flow is input process output input is anything that's coming into your running program it can be key based input it can be your mouse it can be a game console anything can be input process is what you're doing with that input okay are you doing some mathematical calculation with it is that input moving a character in a game anything like that is the process so process acts on input and then output is what the result is so if you're moving your joystick or your game console for a computer game you push the right key the input is that you've pushed the right key the process is oh you've pushed the right key what do I do with it and the output is I move to the right so that is what input process and output is and it seems very simple but it is the basic building blocks of all programming and we're going to have these things in the next two weeks called flow charts this is just a basic flow chart and it has some symbols and the symbols are an oval for a start and an oval for an end an in input and output is the uh, rectangle that's kind of off kilter and the process is just a rectangle um, these these are important because you're going to have to do your own um, you're going to have to do your own flow chart next week or in week three I think it's next week um, so you need to remember these symbols if you're in my class and you don't use the right symbols you are going to get some points taken off not a lot but you're going to get some points taken off the arrows are simply showing us the direction of flow everything has to have a start first thing you're going to do is input second thing you're do, going to do is process third thing you're, you're going to do is output and the final thing is you end that flow okay variable variable is the very first building block for programming and a variable is simply a place to store something it's like a bucket and that bucket has three properties it has scope it has name and it has a value um, the name is a unique identifier and there are some naming conventions like it has to start with a character variable names can't have spaces in them they can only have underscores so there are restrictions on what you can name a variable what does a variable do well it stores a value it stores some piece of data maybe it stores your address maybe it stores the number 42 it, but it stores a piece of information and it exists in a specific scope for now for weeks one and two the scope of our variables will all be global in week three we're going to add local scope but for right now all of your variables are in the global scope so don't worry about scope put scope off to the side worry about name and value okay uh, variable names must start with a character this is a rule variable names may not include spaces or special characters the only non alphanumeric character that variable names can have is an underscore okay how do I define a variable what is all this stuff so I define I tell Python I'm defining a place to store something in computer RAM by first typing the name of the variable num underscore people is the name of the variable the next thing I do is 
I type the equal sign, which is the assignment operator. The third thing I do is I type a value. So if we look at that single equal sign, on the left-hand side is, in this case, two words with an underscore. On the right-hand side is some value. I know num people is a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. That is something that will always be the case in Python. So what happens in computer storage? Well, what happens is Python tells the computer, whoops, my bad, that should have been num people. That's what I get for updating the slides. Num people. We'll fix that a little bit later. All right, sorry about that. My Python script, my variables. I redid these slides a couple weeks ago, so I'm sorry if there are some glitches in them. So computer storage, RAM, name. The name of the place in RAM is going to be num people, and the value is 1. So every time I use num people in my Python, code, the computer is going to equate it to 1. And I will always get the value 1 until num people appears again on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And I assign it to something else. Because, um, sorry, when I assign it to something else, because that's what variables are. They are places to store data. That is their only reason for being. And what you can do is always know that num people is going to be one until you change it. So, and this is in fact, uh, it could be a full Python script. This is in fact a Python script because you have an executable line of code. So, uh, for a complete list of Python keywords, variable names may not be a Python keyword. Python has very specific keywords, which you cannot use for anything else, like def, D-E-F. You cannot use def as a variable name. For a complete list, you want to look at 1.14. OK, so how do I use a variable? This is going to be challenge 1.13.2. We're going to look at it here. And then we're going to look at it in PyCharm, because that's what we do. I will stop going through the lecture, and we're actually going to walk through code. We're going to look at code. We're going to look at the challenges. Oh, and I apologize. I haven't said this yet. You are not required to complete the challenges. The challenges are not graded activities. I strongly encourage you to do the challenges because they can be very helpful in learning to program. But you do not have to do um, the challenges are not required for grading. So I have challenge 1.13.2, and it tells me it wants to write a program that assigns total coins with the sum of nickel and the sum of dime. So we're going to learn, we're going to look at a little bit here, and there's some things we haven't learned yet, like input and int. But I wanted to use this as an opportunity to talk about variables. Because what we have is we have three variables. Even though we have four lines with assignments on them, we have three variables. We have total coins, we have nickel count, and we have dime count. On the right hand side is something that either is a value or produces a value. So total coins is is set to equal zero is the first line. That's pretty explanatory. Nickel count equals int input. Well, int input doesn't look like a value, and it's not. Input is a function that takes something in, and int converts it to an integer. And we'll talk about types in just a bit. Same with dime count. And then when I go to total coins again, same space in memory, now I'm going to reset that. I'm going to reuse that place. And I'm going to put the um, sum of nickel count and dime count, and then I'm going to output it. 
So the rule we have here is that variable names must be unique. All right, I just talked about int strings. There are four types, four um, predefined types for data. data ha and data has to fall into one of these categories. It's either a string, it's an integer, it's a float, or a Boolean. We're not going to talk about Boolean this week, and we're pretty much not going to talk about it next week. We get into Booleans in week three, so don't worry about it. String is simply an ordered collection of letters surrounded by quotes, like the word Lisa. It's in quotes. An integer, oh goodness, I did not read over these well. My apologies. Okay, an integer is a whole number without a decimal place. And a float is a number with a decimal place. These are the three basic types that we're going to worry about for the first two weeks. Okay? That's all you can do. You can have a string, you can have an integer, or you can have a float. Um, the type is determined by the variable store, the, by the value stored in the variable. So if it has quotes around it, it is a string. If it doesn't have quotes around it, it either has to be, for this week and next week, an integer or a float. Those are the only options. Now we're going to talk about that input and print function. Let me take a look real quick. Does anybody ask any questions? Nope. Okay. Now we're going to take a quick foray into functions because I had introduced the int function and the input function. So let's talk about them a little bit. Um, for now, it's going to change later on, week five, I think. A function is Python code that you don't have to write for right now until we up through week four. It's just stuff they've given you that you don't have to. If you call that function, you know the computer is going to do something. And if it's a Python included function, pretty much you know it's going to do it right. And Python actually provides whole libraries of functions. And that means you can get a lot of stuff free. Um, I've listed a link here if you want to go out and look at the just the standard basic functions of Python. And that's not that doesn't include all the stuff you can add in later. Functions have a very specific format. Functions have a name. Just like variables have a name, functions have a name. And na function naming is very similar to variable naming. You have an open parenthesis, a closed parenthesis, and then something in the middle sometimes. So the open and closed parenthesis can be empty. The open and closed parenthesis can have something in them. And some functions return a value. And the functions that return a value, you can set them on the right-hand side of a single equal sign so you can get that value into a variable. And that is, in fact, the only way you can get input into a variable is to set it on the right-hand side of a single equal sign. Whoops, I don't know why it did that. Okay. Converting types and using functions. Uh, using functions. So there are, we have four types, three of which we're going to worry about for the next two weeks. Sometimes you have to convert one type into another. So if I, am, if I have the result of an input, so somebody's typed something on the keyboard, and I want that input to be able to be used as an integer, I have to tell Python that what I'm really looking for is an integer, not a string, because input always returns a string. So I have to convert it. I have to tell Python, hey, even though it started out as a string, I want it as an integer. That's what the int function does. It converts a string to an integer. Now, if you put something in there that's not really an integer, you're going to get a nasty looking message. But if you're inputting an integer in your console, the input function is going to automatically turn that to a string. And you turn that back to an integer using the int function. The same thing with a float. 
if you put in a float on your keyboard and you're using the input function, it's going to go in as a string. So you've got to convert it to a float. And stir converts either a float or an integer back to string, puts quotes around it. This is important for sometimes when you're outputting stuff. You'll use the int and float much more often than you'll probably use the stir, but it's good to know that it's there. All right, let's, ta let's dive into this input function. And there's a link at the bottom of the slide. And by the way, I haven't before put my slides up on YouTube, but I think that I'm going to put them up in um, PDF form um, on YouTube. Uh, uh, sorry. On my YouTube site, you will see the video. In the description, you will also see links to all of the challenges any, any code that we have written or gone through in this class, in this lecture, and separate slides for the lab review. Um, and I think this term I'm also going to put up the lecture's notes as um, a PDF. So let me know what you think next week if you see it. Okay. Input is simply a way to get data into your script. And this can be through a keyboard, mouse, console. I said all this stuff. For our purposes, it's going to be the keyboard. And we want to have what we typed get into the program. And what we use is input. Input is the function name. You're going to have an open parenthesis, a closed parenthesis, and an optional argument. Input takes a string as an optional argument, and it returns a string. So the, the string that you give it is just something that's going to be printed out to the console that will prompt a user what you're looking for. Let's say, please enter an integer. Um, it will always return a string based on what somebody typed and then hit the Enter key to. By the way, the enter key is not set as part of the input statement. It's just whatever you type. So you can be typing away, you hit that enter key, it's going to be transferred into the running program. Output. Output uses something called the print function. And um, I don't know why I have that up there. Again, you guys are the guinea pig for the new slides. I'll fix that. So print has an open parenthesis, a the name is print, it has an open parenthesis, a closed parenthesis, and it takes up to two arguments. You can, the first argument's always going to be a string of some kind. The second argument is telling it which character you want to end with. It's optional because if you don't put that there, it ends in a new line. So. Let's do a quick example for input and output. We're going to have num1 is int input, num2 is int input, and this is 1.3.4. So I have, three, I have two variable names, num1 and num2. I'm going to type in a value, and it's going to be entered into the script and put into num1. And what will happen, let's just say the function call, is equivalent to my var equals input and then int my var. So, and then print is used to output to the computer screen. You can use print to print out a string, an integer, or a float, unless you're adding a string and a, and a um, you're concatenating a string and an integer. If you're doing that, you're going to have to convert the integer or the float to a string. Also, for functions, for every open parenthesis, there has to be a closed parenthesis. So you will notice on num1 equals int, open parenthesis, input, open parenthesis, closed parenthesis, closed parenthesis. There are two open parentheses, so there have to be two closed parentheses. If not, you're going to get an error. So after I said all of that, let's go out and look at PyCharm work. Yes. 
Uh, chat. Okay. Yeah, I will. I will do. I will create the PDF and I will add it to where the documents are, because in the description there are links to a Google Drive that actually have all the challenges and any of the scripts. So I'll put it there as well. Okay. So let's open PyCharm. This is PyCharm. PyCharm is what they call an integrated development environment. And I'll just make that bigger. An integrated development environment. And what basically this, this just makes it easier to program. Um, it tells you things. It shows you things. It makes it easier to see if your parentheses are all balanced. And you can keep lots of programs in it. And here are all of the scripts. So I have challenge 1.3.4 up here. And this, is, this, by the way, this and this forces it to be a multi-line comment. So all of this stuff in gray is just stuff. This is not executable code because it's a comment my int input and I num1 and I have num2 equals int input input another number and I just did this to show you what will happen when there is string inside the input function now one of my very favorite things to do is run this stuff through a debugger because a debugger actually shows you what's happening at every single line of code so first Save the age configuration. I'm going to do challenge 1.4. I'm going to edit the configuration, make sure it has everything I need. Yep, it does. So what I'm going to do, sorry, what I'm going to do is if you look up here, there is a green right arrow. That's to just run it. There is a thing that looks like a bug that will debug it. And that's not just going to run it. What it's going to do is it's going to stop at that red dot and then step through. So I'm going to debug. So I just hit that button after I make sure that my Python script name is in this. It has been selected from this dropdown. So I am going to debug. Now watch what's going to happen. All this stuff down here just changed. So I have the debugger. I have the console. Now, right now, we haven't actually executed any lines of code. We are stopped. And here's how I know we're stopped. There's this big blue line here. That line is a line of code waiting to be executed by the Python interpreter. How did I stop there? Because I put a red dot. How do I put a red dot? That's how you get rid of it. To the right of the number in PyCharm, you just select your mouse and the dot will appear. And that tells PyCharm, stop. Don't execute this line of code, just stop. So here I have that I'm running module 1.3.1.4. I have a console here, which I'll show you how to use in a minute. And then there's special variables. These are variables that we don't have to worry about right now. But we're also going to see what our variables are. So I haven't executed a line of code. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this bent arrow. That bent arrow is called step over, and it says execute this line of code. Python interpreter, execute this line of code. So I'm going to execute that line of code, and I'm going to go over to the debugger tab first. I execute it. Whoops. Frame's not available. Hold on. Let me run it. I think my configuration may be wrong. Stop and rerun. My apologies, I installed the newest version. So, City Bugger. Let's 
stop and rerun. Okay, connected. One, enter, input another. Okay, it was my it was my fault. I I installed the new one and I didn't realize that the carrot had changed. Carrot looked differently in the older version of PyCharm. So let me start this again so I can do what we need to do. Okay, so I'm here. I'm on a line of code that hasn't been exited. I'm going to step over that line of code. I get this, this, this uh, right caret question mark. The right caret question mark, oh, let me do this, sorry. Make this a little bigger. The right caret question mark is wait, it says, I'm waiting for you to input something. It was different in the last one. So I am going, and by the way, we know we are executing this line of code because you see this red, this, this pink over the line of code. So we are in the process of executing that line of code. The interpreter is waiting for us to do something. What it's waiting for us to do is type in an integer. So I'm going to put 42. Now you'll see down here that the prompt has changed. The prompt is now three right, um, three right arrows, three, three uh, greater than signs. So it's kind of waiting to do something. So when I step over this line of code, what's going to happen is you're going to see input another number show up on the screen. I'm not going to have typed it. It's just going to show up. And then we're going to be waiting for me to input another integer. So I'm going to step over this line of code. It now says input another number, which I set up here. And now I'm going to input 17. I'm going to hit the enter key and now I'm stopped on print num1 plus num2. You'll notice nothing has been output yet and I've got the three greater than signs that say okay I'm waiting for something to happen. So I'm going to step over print num1 and num2 and input another number is 59 and that's my bad because I didn't put a new line there. But this is, that's a running program, and this is the debugger. What I usually do is I always start by using the debugger because I get to see what's happening. I get to see what's going on in the program. Um, we'll get rid of age. So... That was 1.3.4. I, I know that PyCharm isn't something we're going to do until next week, but I like to start people getting used to PyCharm and its features because really soon in this class, you're going to have to use this to write your own code. So that's why it's important for me to get you guys used to it in the beginning. Um, and by the way, just in, you know, in case you're asking, there is a free PyCharm, and which is called the Community Edition, and then there is a paid PyCharm. Pie you don't need to buy the paid PyCharm. Pi, you just use this is the Community Edition. You use the Community Edition, you will be just fine in this class. Um, what else did I want to say about this? I don't think anything just yet. So we're going to, whoops, nope, go back to here. Nope, sorry. There, keynote. So that was challenge 1.3.4. Where am I? Right there. So, oh, that doesn't look good. Let's play this. More about print. I said print can be called two ways. Print can be called with um, print can be called two different ways. It can be called with just a string, or it can be called with a string and then a character to end with. So the single string 
example is are just these. You can say print, which is three, two, one, go, and it will print out three, two, one, go. You can do mathematics inside those parentheses because what's going to happen is anything in the parentheses is going to happen before it actually calls print. So you can say two plus two is four. Now two plus two is not a string, but Python is smart enough to know that since there aren't any strings already in there, that that's what you want done. You want to add 2 plus 2 and um, put out the answer. You can concatenate strings with non-strings, and that's what we're doing here in the third example. You're going to, we're going to print out the string, convert to stir, and I want to have the number 42 after it. So I'm going to have the plus sign, which is saying concatenate what's on the left-hand side to what's on the right-hand side, because you cannot add strings together. You can simply butt one up against the other. The way to do that, the way to take a float or an integer and butt it up against a string is to use the stir conversion function with whatever it is you want to convert to a string. And then I can just print word one and word two. Now, the last example says be careful of the hidden new line. When you print, when you just use the print statement with a single string in it or whatever equates to a single string, it will always put a new line at the end. There is a way to change that, and this is by using the two argument example. Okay, and I'm telling you this specifically because you're going to need to know this for one of this week's labs. So here I have print word one and then the next line print, print word two, but I have this comma and equal. The comma just separates two arguments. That's common nomenclature for functions. After the comma, I have end equal. You'll notice end is not in quotes. So end is not a string. End is actual variable name. And then I have the assignment operator to the right. And what this is doing is it's saying, hey, Python, for the print function, do not end with a new line, end with a space. Or I could then the, the num letter X, or it could have been a semicolon. Anything that is a string can be assigned to the variable end. And we're doing that inside the function call. It's kind of compounding stuff, but it is, it's very handy when you're trying to do output. It will be very handy when you're trying to do your project. And you have some labs that are going to require you to remember the end function, or the, sorry, the end variable on a print function. Okay, let's take example 1.7 in action. All right. 1. I don't see 1.7. I don't know why I said that. Uh, let's see. I don't know which one it was. But I'm sure it has something to do with print. Oh, here's another way to also do the print. You can do a dot format, which is one of my preferred ways to do it, although I am starting to use the, the, the newest formatting from 3. But let me look for the end. I apologize for not getting that right. Uh, float. <laughs> Simple escape, simple input, simple print. Okay, well, here is just some examples. Simple print just has some examples of print. And what I really wanted to do is show you how this end works. So I'm just going to debug this a little bit. And whoops, you'll notice it started to run 1.3.4 because that's what I told it here. So I want it to... Uh, edit configuration. I want to go to simple print. Okay. 
So there's simple print. And I'm going to debug simple print. Actually, let's close these guys. Uh, there we are. OK. I've got my, my breakpoint on. I'm going to debug these. We're going to look down here at the console. Whoops, why didn't it debug? Simple print. Step through. Nope. Okay. Well, we're just going to run it then. I don't know why it doesn't want to do this one. You'll see that line three is print hello. Line four is print hello again. And you'll notice that these are on two different lines. And they're on two different lines because print will automatically put a new line after each print statement. However, the third one, you'll know that there is line seven is hello. We get hello right here. Line eight is after special end, and it is not on a new line. It is, in fact, on the same line. And that is because we told this, the print on line 7, to end with a space, not a new line. So, OK. Cases and spaces matter in Python. Python is a case-sensitive, space-delimited language. So an uppercase x is not the same as a lowercase x. And they will have two different places in memory. Um, so even though they're both set to two, they could be set to different things as well. But that's what I mean by case matters. If you type a variable name all lowercase, and then later you type a camel case, and it all of a sudden doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't work, and you get a nasty error in Python, it's because you probably have typed it in a different case previously. Also, Python is a space-delimited language. And this is a very simple example. But I will talk to you about all the space-delimited stuff as we get to it. And basically, the only way Python knows that you're ending a line of code is if there's a new line after it. So on the left here, I have x equal 2 and y equals 4 on two different lines. And that is completely acceptable Python code. On the right, I have x equal 2, space y equal 4. And Python will say that is an error because you cannot have two assignments, two separate assignments, let me say, in the same line. You have to put a new line in between them. And not all characters are visible. Every character has a numeric representation. Um, and some examples are tabs, new lines, and spaces. There's a whole bunch of them that you can go out and find on the web. And that is because every character has a numeric representation. Um, there's UTF-8 characters. The original was ASCII characters, so 250, 0 to 255. And, um, each character had a numerical representation. So in the computer, you are dealing with actually the binary representation of the number. But you're not dealing with a space. You're dealing with the numerical representation of a space, which is 32. So even though I can't see it and you can't see it, it's still the computer is still dealing with it as an individual thing. Just because it's not visible doesn't mean it's not there in the computer. The same with tabs and new lines. OK. Um, backslash is your friend. Sometimes you have to escape characters. If I want a backslash in a print statement, I'm going to have to double backslash it. Because if not, Python could very well think that I am trying to escape a character that you know, isn't that that um, means something else. This often happens when you're using quotes. 
because quotes are very special in Python. And if you try to add a quote inside of a quoted string like O'Donnell, you might have a problem. Now, there are a couple ways to deal with this. But one of the ways that they want us to talk about in Zybox is the backslash. Because this, these two quotes open and close a string. But then I have this other little guy in here. And if I didn't backslash it, if I didn't escape it, Python would say that I have an error here. And actually, I'll go out and show you this. An error because I closed my string too early. And then I have this Donald after it. So also, I might have some complex print statements. And I want to put, I want to, make my formatting look really, really nice for my game. So I'm going to put tabs in there, or I'm going to put new lines in there. And the way to do that is to use the escape sequence for it, the slash n or the slash t, backslash n or backslash t. Just like here, bake cookies 1.1 preheat oven. Um, I want to show you guys some error conditions. So let's, what's this guy? No. Uh, let me look. Yeah, let's do this one, because it also shows us another way to use the print function. So sorry, I'm trying to make it bigger so you guys can actually see it. So here I just have a quick program. I have total points equals zero, user number equals input, integer, and then a new line, slash n, and then print you entered format user number. OK. So this will run. So let's do 3.11.2. So I'm going to go to 3.11.2. And I'm just going to run this in the beginning. It's going to say enter a number. I'm going to enter the number 42. Whoops, my bad. I'm down here. I'm going to enter the number 42. And it says you entered 42. All fine. But now let me mess this up some. First of all, I'm going to do this. All I did was take away the zero. And now I'm getting a red squiggly line. If you are using PyCharm, Mind the red squiggly lines because they are telling you something is wrong. So I'm going to run it again, and I get this whole big long thing here, down here in the in the console, and it's telling me that I have a syntax error, invalid syntax. Well, when I'm looking at that, total coins is fine. It's just a variable name, and it's a valid variable name. And then I have my assignment operator. So what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it, it's the statement's not complete. Python says your statements have to be complete, and this is not a complete statement. Then I have down here, now if I try and run this again, it'll work. Now, if, so everything's working. Now, let me mess it up again. Remember I said you have to have balanced parentheses? Well, I just unbalanced my parentheses again. We get this nice little squiggle. And let's take a look at the error message that we're going to get. Now, this is one of the things that's frustrating about computer programming languages. And I used to write one, so I understand why. But if you look at this, it says it tells us what line, line 8. And it says print, you entered, open squiggly, dot format, user num. But this line of code is line 8, and it looks pretty much intact to me. Looks good to me. My, my parentheses are balanced. My dot's in the right place. So sometimes when you're writing a program, you have to look back at the previous line of code. So in this case, the real problem is that I don't have a parenthesis where I should. So I'm going to put the parenthesis back. Um, now, there's also, I was talking about string concatenation with plus. There's also a way for you to um, use 
what's called the format function and just drop a number. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. But this is a different way to format stuff. And I don't think it's in Chapter 1. I think it's in Chapter and Module 2. So let's go and do this. No questions yet. Let's go talk about the labs. Okay, and this is what I do every week. I review the labs. On the, for the first two weeks, we're going to review using flowcharts. Starting at week three, we're going to start using um, pseudocode because you have to do a lot of stuff in pseudocode. So, first of all, let's talk about how we read these word problems, because that's what they are. There are certain uh, cues that you can read when you're doing the word problem to figure out what you have to do and how to translate that, in fact, into what, you know, where things are in the module. So, this says complete the program to read four values from input and store the values and variables, first name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. Program uses the input values to output a short story. Now, I didn't put the short story stuff here because it gives you the short story. That print statement is already inside the lab. Don't change it. But what you do have to do is you're going to have four lines of code. Those four lines of code are going to be variables followed by input statements. And they're giving you the names of those variables. You have to use the names that they're giving you in order for the code that Zybooks provides to work. So you're going to have four variables. You're going to have first name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. And you're going to have them on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign, you're going to have an input statement. Now, you can't sit there and type at the keyboard when you're in Zybooks. So the question is, where is it coming from? Zybooks relies on the use of the input statement so that it can actually feed data to your program. Now, in the program, in the, in the problem statements, sometimes you will see example data. That example data is only there for you to test with. When you actually go to run your program and submit it, Zybox is going to put all different kinds of data in there. So if you run it and it looks like it's okay, and then, and then you submit it and all of a sudden you get all these errors, then it's because Zybox is inputting different data and your programming isn't quite handling that data right. So that's just something to be aware of. And when you do the input, it should, there's only a few times in Zybooks where you actually have anything in between the parentheses. So this is just based on input and output. There's no process for lab 1.9, but you have to define the variables and give them the names that they, in fact, have told you in the program. So then we have lab 1.12. And this has got a couple of parts. So what we have here is, say, a variable like usernum can store a value like an integer. So you're going to have to store an integer. And extend the given program as indicated. So you're going to have usernum, and you're going to int, do an int input. And then you're going to output the user's input you're going to output it squared and cubed. So these are going to be two different print statements, two different lines of code. And then you're going to get a second integer, user num2, and output the sum and the product. So this is another two print statements. So even though it's only got three lines, there are more than, there's more than one line of code for each requirement in this problem. So... Um, and output, when it says output for everything we're doing in this class, it always means use the print function. So I'm going to start. I'm going to input my user num. I'm going to convert it to an integer. Now I could do this in two separate lines, 
or I could do it like the stuff we've been looking at, the challenges we've been looking at. Int, open parentheses, the word input, open close parentheses, and then the final close parentheses. Then you're going to square it, and then you're going to output the squared of user num. Then you're going to cube user num, and you're going to output it. Now, you could do this calculation in, in just, and the output in just one line, but, it, but you don't have to. Input user num two, then we're going to do the uh, convert it to an integer. We're going to sum it. We're going to output the sum. We're going to multiply it. We're going to output the multiplication. Now, one thing to note about flowcharts and and um, and pseudocode when we get to it, they are language agnostic. So sometimes there may be steps spelled out in a flowchart that you don't absolutely have to do that way in your code. You can combine some of these things and make it shorter. But because flowcharts and pseudocode are language agnostic, it's required that you put out all of the different pieces that you're going to. And you, we have our correct symbols. We have the skewed rectangle, we have the regular rectangle, and we have the start and end. And then let's go to the next one, 1.23. We're going to create, this says, writer programming users enters user num and x as input and output user num divided by x three times. So really what we're doing is we're going to say user num divided by x. That's the first one. The second one is whatever resulted from user num divided by x. And we're going to divide by x again, and then we're going to do that a third time. So you've got an input, you're going to convert it to an integer, you're going to input, sorry, your input user num, input x, convert them to integers, then you're going to divide by user num, and I, ha I have a variable div equal user num divided by x, I'm going to output div, now div2 is div divided by x, and then output, and then div3 is div2 divided by x, and output. So this is lab 1.24. It's a little bit more complicated. Now, they give you this print statement. That print statement is going to be in your Zybooks lab. You'll notice they are using a variable called calories. And they're using a very specific input format. Don't worry about it. Don't change this. But your final variable should be named calories, all lowercase. And if you do that, it will work with this print statement. So they want you to input four variables, age, weight, heart rate, and time. So age is years, weight is pounds, heart rate is beat per minute, and time is whatever the whole minutes are. Then you're going to put the output of the calories burned. And each floating point value with two digits after the decimal point can be achieved by following this. And they've got a calculation in there as well that will calculate the average calories burned for a person. So that calculation is in there. And if you name things age, weight, heart rate, and time, just like it is here, you get your input correct, that calculation should be relatively easier. Easy. And so we've got our flow chart. We're going to input our four different uh, pieces of information into four different variables. We're going to convert them, we're going to calculate, and we're going to output. And finally, the final one, and I know we've gone just over, and I apologize. Um, they, this is a, a lab in three parts. So they're going to prompt the user to input an integer between 32 and 126, a float, a character, and a string. So you're using the, the different types and they want you to do a single character, but the character is in fact a single character is in fact a string. Storing each into separate variables, then output the four variables on a single line separated by a space. So this is going to be a print statement. And then extend to also output in reverse. So you're going to you're going to output um, the integer float, the character, and the string. And then you're going to output the string, the character, the float, the integer. 
Um, and then you want to convert the integer to a character using the chr function and output that character. And the reason you have to do, have to input between 32 and 126 is because those are the visible characters in the ASCII table. Um, so I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions? And you're welcome to open up your mics and talk. Okay. Going once. Going twice. I will stop sharing and I will stop the recording and everybody have a wonderful evening. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, okay, cool. Nobody has any questions. So I am going to uh, stop the recording.